Amen. Good singing. Well, tonight we will conclude our series um, on the transfer of treasure. And uh, let's go back to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, as you're turning there, our uh, message tonight is entitled, Transferring Treasure Adds Up. Transferring Treasure Adds Up. It just makes sense to do that for the Christian. Uh, We're in a day and age, a time and place that is quite unprecedented as far as the amount of wealth that is concentrated in certain places of the world. And America is no exception. We have, um, you know, the average uh, person in America lives much, much, much better than the average person anywhere else in the world. And I'm not saying there's not uh, poverty in our country or great needs in our country, but comparatively speaking, and the studies would bear it out, uh, America is an exceptional country in many ways, especially in our material wealth. We also live in an interesting time where spending that money is unprecedented. It's so easy. Uh, You don't even need to leave home anymore to go broke. You can do it right from your living room, right? Right from the computer. In my lifetime, I've gone from no online shopping available to getting anything you need online uh, at the click of a button. In uh, Baltimore, Amazon had something called Prime Now. Now, it's not enough that you can sign up for Amazon's little thing and get a bunch of stuff in two days, which is really, really quick, you know, faster than it used to be. It used to maybe take a week or so to get stuff here from regular catalogs, and and they sped that up and really revolutionized things. But in Baltimore and other major hubs where their bigger warehouses are, where they keep more commonly purchased items on the shelf, you could order from your phone or tablet or computer and have stuff to your door within one to two hours of ordering it. It was, it was wild. When we moved into our house, our cable wasn't set up, and my favorite college football team was playing, and I just couldn't imagine a world where I'm sitting in front of a television and I can't watch my Florida Gators play football. I just, I just couldn't imagine it. And I, and I discovered that the um, uh, local, local networks were going to carry the game. So I got on Amazon Prime because we're busy doing all this stuff at the house. I don't got time to run to the store. And they had one of those screw-in-the-back antennas that get the local stations. So I hit that, and before game time, I was ready to go. And, uh, I mean, th- it's a crazy world. It's a crazy world. And, and if you're a person... Oh, okay, how about this? They, they have apps to deliver groceries to your house, yeah. to deliver meals to your house, to bring a car to your house and drive you anywhere you want to go. I mean, at the touch of a button. If you don't have any restraint in your level of finances, that, this is a dangerous game, okay? You thought credit cards were bad, okay? You link up your bank card and, and we got problems, um, And by the way, the retailers are happy to continue taking that money. They're not concerned about what's in your bank account. They're concerned about what's in their bank account, right? And and this is the kind of world we live in, and yet it is in the same materialistic, uh, gotta have it, gotta have it now, gotta have the best right now, that we're called of God to live selflessly and to give of ourselves, our time, our talents, our treasures. Complete opposite of what everything in our culture screams at us to do today. Um, It it was funny the day that I learned of product placement in movies and how the movie production companies to help earn money for their films would make deals with certain corporations. So then in certain scenes of certain movies, they would have the drink with the label pointed to the camera, you know, or, or whatever the case may be, a certain car in the driveway, and it just so happens that that manufacturer has a deal with it, and this is the society that we're in. And yet, Christ gives us words like what we're about to read in Matthew chapter 6, and I've mentioned them many times before, but 
it is only appropriate in this final message that we go back to where we started. But before we do, let's ask the Lord to bless this time in his word. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we, we come to you, um, a needy people. And uh, this area of our finances, if we're not careful, Lord, it can get out of control in a hurry. And it seems to be made even easier by the culture in which we live. Help us, Lord, to, to show uh, discipline in this area. That we would demonstrate your transforming work in our life, specifically in this area of finances and giving to the work of the Lord and, and giving to organizations that promote the work of the Lord throughout the world and, and just being a generous person. Not seeing the item on the shelf and considering how that might benefit my life, but considering how I might be an encouragement and help to somebody else's life. Lord, do a transformative work in our life tonight as we close out this series. Help us to be joyful givers, cheerful givers, generous in every area of our life. And, and the joy and the blessing that we would experience of you would make us only want to do it more. Help us to understand that, Lord. Help us to understand we uh, can't take it with us, but we can send it on ahead. Help us to uh, let that truth sink into our hearts tonight and be better givers as a result of it. And, and in my life as well, Lord, may we all take this to heart tonight. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Jesus says, as we've mentioned before in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, 19 to 21, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Christ wants to use things like this in his word to help us understand how important it is, this thing of giving and the godly management of all of our resources. Of all of our resources. I'm not just talking about how you spend your money. I'm talking about everything that the Lord has allowed to pass through your hands. Considering how might I use this for His glory? How might I use this to, to advance His mission and His purposes in this, in this world? Uh, how might I draw somebody, point them to Christ through these things? These are the things that need to pass through our heads. And, and it is certain the world's not going to help us think that way. Only the Word of God will help us think that way. Um, and we need more of that in our life. One man um, illustrated this well. He was with a friend and he was trying to help him see kind of the Christian perspective on money. So he took out a, a piece of paper much like this and he wrote the word God on it. And um, he held it up to his friend and he said, can you read the word on this page? And he said, yes, it, it says God. And he says, okay, yeah, you're right. Then he proceeds to take a coin out of his pocket and he holds the coin up in front of the page such that the word could no longer be seen. And he said, now can you read the word on the page? And no, I can't. Well, well why not? Well, you hold, you're holding an object in front of it. Yeah, I'm holding a coin in front of it. And the point he's trying to make is this is what happens in our life when we allow our wealth, our resources to take such a prominent position in our life. It clouds our view of the God in our life, of Jesus Christ in our life. Even though God is much bigger than our money. He's much bigger than any coin. He's much bigger than all the wealth of this world. He owns it all, right? We're just his money managers. That's something that we've learned in this study. And yet, when we get our eye on that treasure, our perspective begins to shift. And the things that should be more easily seen are not as easily seen. And, and we have to be careful uh, about how we handle that. And um, so tonight, I want to give you four final considerations. Considerations that all Christians should make with respect to their finances. We'll see tonight, when you lay them out, when you put them together, you will see that giving to the Lord really does 
add up. Number one, I, I want us to see my, I personalized these points tonight, my ability to give. My ability to give. Romans chapter 12, verse, verses 6 through 8. Paul is, is listing out some spiritual gifts, seven of them. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion, proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, and he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Now, you read what I just read. What's included in those lists of spiritual gifts? Giving, Giving is included in those uh, list of spiritual gifts. And are we restricted to just one spiritual gift? Absolutely not. No, the Lord does a work in our lives such that there may be some gifts that are more prominent than others, but certainly uh, if you have the ability to, to give, that gift is in your life. Um, giving is a gift of the Lord. And yet, while when we think of spiritual gifts, we don't often think of giving. We don't often think of generosity and charity. We think of the teaching part, the preaching part, the encouraging part. These are the things that we focus on, and, and giving um, kind of gets left off the list a little bit. But people who understand the power of giving, they understand the gift of giving, the ability to give, they know it's a gift. They know they would not be so, such generous people if not for the Lord working in their life. They've seen the blessing of the Lord. They understand what it is to joyfully and cheerfully give, and they love it. They don't see it as a burden. It's seen as a joy. It's not something they have to do. It's something they get to do. Uh, I wrote this little phrase underneath your first point there. Uh, the gift of giving helps support and sustain all the other gifts. Let me say that again. The gift of giving helps support and sustain all the other gifts. What am I saying? You enhance the other gifts when you're giving. You help the preacher, like myself, do preaching full time. Why? Because you've given to the Lord. Otherwise, I'd be out working a job, and that job may restrict me from being able to preach in certain services. I'm freed of that because you give. You see what I'm saying? The, uh, uh, the, 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 the ministries that we have, um, how do we purchase the curriculum for our teachers? Through the giving of the people. Okay, Your giving is a gift of the Lord that supports and sustains all the other gifts. I could go on and on, but basically God uses the giving of His people to... Um, kind of be the fuel in the tank of ministry, right? He, he can do it without, you know, sometimes people get the big head and they think I've done, you know, X, Y, and Z, and boy, that church would really hurt if I stopped giving, you know, and they start to get that perspective, and, and that's not what I'm going towards at all. But, but what I am saying is you get to have a part in what God is doing. He doesn't need your money, but he can use it to bless others and you in the process. Remember we said last week, we shovel it in and God shovels it back and the problem is God has a bigger shovel than we do. It's, it's something though that does need to be discussed from time to time. We feel comfortable discussing the other spiritual gifts, but when it comes to giving, don't talk about it. It's weird to talk about money. Don't do that. You know what I'm saying? We, we leave it alone. It's, it's like a child's education. In school, we want them to know their math. We want them to know their science. We want them to know their history. We want them to, well, I'm not sure about the history part anymore, but we, we want them to know their English and, and, and all this other crazy stuff that they're pumping out there today, but we won't teach them how to manage a checkbook. We won't teach them how to manage a bank, a bank account. And, and they'll go out and they'll bankrupt themselves in student loans and, 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 and all this kind of other craziness and, and, and buy and buy and buy and, and not think about the real life consequences of the finances. And we don't talk about it. 
And yet it's a major stumbling block for every child coming out of school. Uh, In the church house, we teach our children every week. In children's church, we give them the word of God. We we, uh, tell them about Jesus Christ, how we can know him, how we can follow his plan for their life. And yet still we neglect the area of giving. What to do with with the money. I love parents who will um, begin to help their older children understand working by giving them an allowance and then also teaching them how to manage that allowance. It's not just to go buy candy bars, right? And okay, here's a dollar, and so we believe in tithing, so that means how much goes to the Lord, and you help them figure it out, and when you're in church the next day, you put a dime in the offering plate, or whatever the case may be, and I've always loved seeing children give, because children tend to be more generous than adults. They don't have any bills. <laughs> they don't have, have to put the roof over their head. You know, they get $5 for doing dishes. They want to put three in the plate. And they love it. They think it's awesome, you know. And, and, and these are the kind of things we need to do uh, such that giving is treated as another um, area of the Christian life. And it's given the same level of importance. We, we have to understand it's, a, it's an ability that that like a muscle needs exercise, it needs work, or atrophy can set in, and that muscle can begin to uh, harm itself and the rest of the body. And so we need to understand that. Letter A, a couple of ways we can do this. Encourage the gift in one another. Encourage the gift in one another. If you feel like you're doing something alone, you might not be as motivated to keep it up. But when you know you're working together with others to do it, it's encouraging to do it. That's why the Bible says in Hebrews 10.24 that we're to consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. All right? Is giving to the Lord a good work? You better believe it is. And it's done out of a heart of love. So this verse is referring to giving among all the other good works that we do. One of the reasons we pass offering plates in the services is to provoke one another to love and to good works. You see the plate pass and you're reminded, give to the Lord. It's part of being a Christian, okay? It's, it's just something that's there. And it's not for show. We don't do that for show. But we do that to worship the Lord. That's as much a part of our worship as singing the songs are worship. And, and preaching is worship. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let everything that we do as Christians bring honor and glory to the Lord. Um, But we might object. We might say, well, uh, you know, we shouldn't really be comparing uh, one another's giving. That's kind of, I don't know, that makes me feel a little uncomfortable. But let her be. Understand that there is biblical precedent for this. Um, We see Paul, in writing to the church in Corinth, he compares their giving to the church in Macedonia. I've already mentioned this a couple of times in this series. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 7 and 8 says, Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and in all diligence and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also, which in the previous verses he was referring to their giving. I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others and to prove the sincerity of your love. How did Paul know the churches in Macedonia loved him? Because they gave to support what he was trying to do. It's pretty simple. It's pretty simple. And that was a comparison right there. Maybe he didn't give exact figures, but don't you think that provoked the church in Corinth to love and to good works? Boy, we know about those folks. We've got it far better, and we're doing far less. We need to get on our horse and get going. Letter C, motivation is greater than operation. Having the right motivation is more important than how you give. Because another objection would be, well, the Bible teaches, Christ teaches, that you, you shouldn't let your right hand know what your left hand's doing. So, therefore, everything should be secret about giving. And, and indeed, Christ says in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 1, Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. 
Okay, uh, that verse is directed toward a person's motivation more than their operation. Notice he said, to be seen of men. The reason they gave openly and publicly wasn't to provoke, it was to show off. It was to promote their own uh, perceived levels of holiness, okay? And there's a problem there. It's about the why more than the how. Giving gifts in sincerity and love and devotion to the Lord is important. And how do I know this? Because in the same sermon, the same Sermon on the Mount, you go back one chapter to chapter 5 and verse 16. Christ says, let your light so shine where? Before men. Does that mean they're going to see your light? Yeah, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Which is in heaven. Man, what, what about a church that takes up a collection to help with a need in a community? What's that? That's letting men see the good works. And who are they going to glorify? The, our Father, which is in heaven. Because they talk to somebody in the church and say, why did you do that? Because we love our neighbors. Because we love our community. This week, I had the privilege of meeting with Thompson's uh, first selectman. Her name's Amy St. Ann. She's in her second term here. And she made time to meet with me, so I was very gracious, uh, grateful for that. And in that meeting, I simply wanted to introduce myself and our church and just say, we're here. We want to be a help and a resource to you and to this community. And we want to... We, and we want to be a help in any way that we can. I'm not aware of any obvious things. And, and she, it was kind of new to her because I said, I'm sure you have other churches that, that work with the town. And you know what she told me? They don't. They don't. They're aware of some, but this was the first of its kind. I don't say that to my credit. I say that to God's glory. Amen. He's opened an effectual door for us in this, in our Jerusalem, folks. In our Jerusalem, we would do well to hit this area hard in every way that we can. She spoke about some of the needs and some of the ways that, that we could help. And so just pray about that. I only say that now so you pray about that and know that this church is moving forward and, and outward. And outward. We want to be seen and known in this community. I'm not content just to show up on community day. Okay, I, I want to be at things. I want to have a presence and I want to be hands on with things. Not in an ecumenical way where I'm standing on a stage with a bunch of other religions. Not in that way. Okay, but, but, but a way that we can minister to people in the community and tell them of Jesus Christ. That's what I'm about and that's what we're going to do. Let our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. We are raising money for our parking lot. That's not a hidden amount. Okay, the total's in your bulletin. It's listed there every week. Uh, I'm getting a, 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 a unique fundraising photo to put out in the lobby to help us see where we're at and where we need to be. I want to finish that thing, okay? Not because, um, you know, any selfish reasons or anything like that, but it's very practical, okay? A paved parking lot behaves much nicer when a plow, snow plow goes over it. Did you see that big dirt area on this side over here that's a plow grabbing it and he's not digging in he's just plowing like he would any other lot and that's what happens uh, with the type of parking we have uh, not only that but think about for our members and our guests walking across that lot you don't know if your next step's going to be one of these okay and so these are ways that we invest in the work of the lord Think about the people. We, we're, we're on a state road here. You know how many people drive this road? You know what they're going to see when they see a paved parking lot? A lit up sign at night? A lit up steeple? A building and grounds that are taken care of? They're going to see people that are serious about this thing. And by the way, we're in a church that knows how to be serious about these things. I have been blessed to see our church step up in a variety of ways and meet the needs of our people. It truly has touched my heart. It's not something to hide or not discuss. It's something to put out there and provoke one another to love and good works. There's a story of a pastor who, who um, he visited one of the missionaries in Africa 
that they supported. He came back. They had a great financial need. These new believers in Christ were coming on hard times upon trusting in Jesus Christ, and they wanted to be a help. He brought the need before the, before the people, and you know who led the giving? A little girl. A little girl who looked at mom and dad and said, hey, you, you know that money that we're saving up to go to Disney World? I think they could use it more than us. And they brought that money, and they, for, go, for, for, they forsook their trip to Disney World and Mickey Mouse, and they put it at the feet of that pastor. And by the time that movement was done, without even taking an offering, $60,000 had been raised for that missionary and that one specific need. That, my friend, is provoking one another to love and good works. And you know who gets the glory? God does. God does. Because he moves in our hearts to do things that are unprecedented. They're unprecedented. Letter D, we see that there's an Old Testament example. I don't have time to cover this, but we see from 1 Chronicles 29, the people giving willingly to the temple, and it was, was top-down giving. The leaders, the chiefs, everybody gave. Um, the, the, the lesson is just that we all have a role to play in giving to the work of the Lord. Don't look at your current income status and think, I can't afford to give. My friend, you can't afford not to give. Make it a priority. You can't afford not to give. Make it a priority, and trust me, the blessings will come in. The Lord will look after you. The Lord will help you with your needs. Make it a priority. I'm sure there's areas where you can, not, uh, you can cut and, and not have to have in your life. Uh, I'm just saying, make it a priority. It's an ability. Number two, it's a destiny. Understand my destiny to give Esther chapter 4, and I must hurry on. Mordecai uh, is talking to Esther, and when you think about Esther's situation, that really was divine, wasn't it? Yes. That really was of the Lord. He put her in the role of a queen as a Jew in the midst of a situation where the Jews were under threat of extinction, basically, in the kingdom due to a, a wicked man named Haman. And he told her those inspiring words. Who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? And I can't help but think, here we are in this time. With the, with the wealth and the prosperity that we see in our land and in our pocketbooks. Who are we to hold that back from the Lord? Who are we not to use every tool in our toolbox to move forward the mission of the Lord. You may not see giving as a way to fulfill your God-given destiny, but my friend, when you invest in a specific need and you see lives touched as a result, you're going to start to think differently about that whole destiny thing. You will begin looking for ways to increase your generosity. The Bible says in Ephesians 2.10 that we are as workmanship, we're created in Christ Jesus into good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. You notice it didn't say that we're created in Christ Jesus to go and have lavish vacations. You know it said that we're not created in Christ Jesus to go and have the nice car, nicest car from the dealership. Okay, It's okay to live humbly. It's okay to not have what everybody else has, and you'll still have a more fulfilling, more rewarding, more complete life. And give to the Lord instead. If we're created unto good works, don't you think giving is one of those universal good works? All I'm saying is this. The, these things in life that we can afford at different times, they're, they're not in and of themselves bad. They're good things. It's nice to get away for a while. My family, got we got away for a while. It was nice. Okay? But don't let... The good cloud out the best. Because good things can become the enemy of the best things. These are the things to think about. Okay, These are the things to give to the Lord. Lord, I know of this specific thing, and I really want to give, but I've got these other things. Help me to know what you want me to do. And, he, and he'll help you. Okay, That brings me to my, my third point, and that is our, in our scrutiny, my scrutiny to give. And this just means... Different questions that people ask. Letter A, how much is God leading me to give above and beyond in free will offerings? How much is God leading me to give?
to give above and beyond in free will offerings. I'm talking about above the tithe, the 10%, uh, which we said last week was kind of the uh, uh, starting point to help a Christian understand how they ought to give to the Lord on a regular basis. And, and how much? Well, there's no specific right answer. It's as the Lord leads. But the Bible says in James 1.5 that if you lack wisdom, ask God. And what does he do? He gives to all men liberally. He abradeth not. That means he withholds not, and it shall be given him. Go to the Lord. Okay? Make that a desire of your heart. There's too many other wicked desires in this heart, in our hearts. We need to get some godly desires in our hearts. Uh, letter B, is obeying God in the area of giving a burden? Is it a burden? The Bible says in 1 John 5, 3, that this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. Okay, It, it shouldn't be seen as a burden to obey the Lord, and, 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 and giving is one of those areas of obedience. In fact, there's joy in obeying the Lord. The Bible says in Psalm 119, 47, I will delight myself in thy commandments which I have loved. Uh, letter C, should I start with secular organizations? Um, sometimes you have extra money and you know of these different places that you like to support, but they're not necessarily Christian organizations. Well, the Bible teaches in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 that you ought to start with your local church uh, for the Christian. Okay, You start in and through your local church church and, and then you know beyond there there's nothing wrong with being generous to these different organizations but i want to challenge you in this area in almost every case when you find a charitable secular organization you can find if you do the research a christian organization who's doing the same thing okay and, and so i would encourage you to do that simply for this reason that Christian organization, and you'll we'll have to do your research just because they say they're Christian doesn't mean they're, they're carrying out the, the Great Commission, but they're going to be focused on the Great Commission, okay? They're not just sending a bag of rice to somebody who needs it to get them full and they'll be hungry the next day. They're sending with that the gospel, right? Uh, these, things are, these things are vital, okay? Because we know that um, only Jesus brings the bread of life and the living water, um, it, otherwise, it's, it's kind of sending your money down the tubes, okay? You want to put it into things that have eternity in view. Letter D, how can I encourage others to give also? And, and I would just simply encourage you to do this. Um, talk about your giving. Not in a boastful way. Hey, I got to give to this. You don't have to even mention specific amounts. You could start giving groups, generosity groups. Hey, pastor, we formed this group. We want to help with specific needs. You let us know what the need is, and we're going to pray about it, and we're going to meet that need. Uh, you could start things like that in the church to, to help meet certain needs. You could do Bible studies on the joys of giving and things like that. Uh, it's not something you have to shy away from. That's what I'm trying to say. It's not something that you have to pretend is taboo in the church. It's something you can talk about. Okay, uh, and when you do it, it's easier to talk about. When you don't do it, you don't want to talk about it. <laughs> All right, that's kind of how that goes. Uh, lastly, lastly, and I do need to hurry. Uh, my conformity to give. My conformity to give. This is what this study has all been about: molding us more into the image of Jesus Christ, who gave of Himself for us everything. He lived a life of poverty, basically. No place to lay his head. No concern about a career or retirement or benefits or investments or none of that stuff. He was here for a short time and, and, he, and he knew the time and he knew when his hour was come, right? And, 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 and he lived it to the fullest and he didn't let a moment pass. Um, and, and these are the things that we need to mold our life towards. And so what I want to do is give you these, this last quick list here. Uh, it's six things, um, and they're kind of statements. Um, and so what I want you to do as we fill in the blanks and we go through them, I want you to, if it's totally up to you. I'm not going to check on any of this. This is your personal stuff. Um, if you want to be challenged to grow in that area, Put your initial next to that statement, okay? Put your initial next to that statement and pray about these things, okay? Number one, God owns everything. 
I'm just his money manager. God owns everything. I'm just his money manager. Psalm 24, 1 says that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. I will ask him what he wants me to do with his money. Letter B. I will give God his first fruits, starting with at least 10%. I will give God his first fruits, starting with at least 10%. We remember the stuff about not robbing God in tithes and offerings from Malachi chapter 3, but verse 10 is a real encouraging one because it says, Bring the tithes in the storehouse that there may be meat in my house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. And that, that means test me. See if I won't do this. If I will not open you the windows of heaven, of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Uh, wow, God has a bigger shovel. <laughs> Le- uh, um, letter C. Of the remaining 90%, I will endeavor to give generously through free will offerings. Okay? Um, when God calls us to give, we must not slow, be slow to obey. God's going to move different hearts at different times. And there may be a need that, you know, I don't know for one reason or another just doesn't really speak to you, but there may be something where you're like, Yes, I want to get behind that, and you just go all in. If the Lord puts that on your heart, do it. Don't come up with an excuse why you should hang on to that money. Get it out of your hand, because it's better off serving an eternal purpose than sitting in your uh, temporary uh, purpose account, okay? Uh, 2 Corinthians 9.11 says, Being enriched in in everything to all bountifulness, which causes through us thanksgiving, to God. We have all the riches we could ever need the day that we trusted Christ as our Savior. Heavenly riches for eternity. Everything else is just a bonus. And God can use it a lot better than we can. Letter D. I will ask God to grow me in this area and to keep debt out of my life so I can be free to give as God leads me to give. That's a tough one right there. It's easy to get in debt. It's real hard to get out of it. And I know everybody's in a different situation. But if you will ask God to help you be disciplined in this area, you will find it um, uh, feasible, an accomplishment that's worth doing to eliminate that debt from your life. And then you don't have to think as hard, can I afford to give? Am I going to be able to make that payment? Am I going to be able to take care of that bill? You already know this is taken care of and I'm not taking on debt because when I take on debt, that weighs me down and I can't give the way I truly want to give. I can't be a blessing the way I truly want to be a blessing. Letter E, I will recognize the temporary nature of this life and its treasures and determine to live for God, storing up treasures in heaven instead. And then finally, letter F, recognizing... The joy that giving brings, I will strive to encourage others to join in the same. It all comes down to this. You only get one shot in this life. There are no do-overs. Once you're gone, you're gone. Five minutes after you're gone, you'll know exactly where you stand. There's a story of a man named Alfred Nobel, Nobel. And in 1888, he was a Swedish chemist. He made a lot of money on a certain invention, dynamite. And in producing dynamite. He had a brother who lived in France named Ludwig. His brother died, sadly. And he picked up the paper from Paris and read what he thought was his brother's obituary. The headline of the obituary read, The Merchant of Death is Dead. It went on to describe a man who had become rich through helping people kill one another. What he realized, sadly, is the editor had confused the two brothers and was actually writing his obituary. And he was alive to read it. This, as you can imagine, was quite a shock to the system. 
This was how he was viewed by society at large. And though he considered himself a success, the world had a very different picture. Completely changed his priorities. And for the rest of his life, which ended up being only another eight years, he devoted his funds and his resources to putting together an award that recognizes those whose inventions helped society. And that award became known as the Nobel Prize. All that because a person saw their life memorialized before their eyes. It completely changed their priority. And I got to wondering, how might I respond if that were me? How might you respond if that were you? Not that you live according to other men's opinions. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying, take account of your life. Of the generosity, of the charity, of the, of the good works, of the things that you're doing to show forth the praises of the one who's called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. There is a phrase of Christ that's not recorded in the Gospels that is recorded in Acts. It's the only one. Acts 20, 35. Jesus said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. I find it interesting that that's the only one where that happens. It's almost as if there's a focus there, don't you think? When we live out God's greatest commands to love God and to love others, one of the ways we show our obedience is in our giving, our finances, how we handle them. But Jesus describes it best, so I'm going to leave you with his words on the matter. Luke chapter 6 and verse 38. He says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Think about those things. Make giving a priority in your life. You can always uh, just stay where you're at or get a little bit not as good as where you want to be, but you can always do better. Strive to that. Work to that. Not because you're seeking some kind of credit or recognition, but because you know that God can use you in that area. And that in that one way, you might not be a gifted speaker. You might not have the words to say to be a great encourager. But if there's a need, you can meet it. Amen. That might be you. Ask God to work in your heart in these things. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. I hope that this was a, a challenge that would speak to our hearts. Both ones that are here and ones watching online. That this would... Just speak to us uh, fresh and anew on this subject that often gets overlooked, but is so important to your work. I'm thankful to be part of a giving church, and I'm thankful to be part of a place that recognizes the ways in which we can fulfill your great commission. How that truly our uh, treasure reveals the location of our heart, the intention of our heart. Help us, Lord, to think about all the ways that you've given to us all the ways that you've worked in our life. And in some small way, we can give back. Help us to do that in the furtherance of your kingdom, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.